It's the Maxwell Institute Podcast. I'm Blair Hodges, bringing you another interview in our series on the Maxwell Institute's brief theological introductions to the Book of Mormon. Kylie Nielsen Turley joins us to talk about her volume on Alma chapters 1 through 29. The series editors broke Alma in half because of its length. Turley teaches in the English department at Brigham Young University. And for more information about the Brief Theological Introduction series, go to mi.byu.edu slash brief on the World Wide Web. You can check out all the information about the series there. Questions and comments about this and other episodes of the Maxwell Institute podcast can be sent to me at mipodcast at byu.edu. Let's dig into the first part of Alma with Kylie Nielsen Turley. Kylie Nielsen Turley, welcome to the Maxwell Institute podcast. Thank you. Welcome to my backyard. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> we're here in Salt Lake City, <laughs> and we're staying distant from each other, and uh, we're just enjoying the wonderful weather. You might hear some birds chirping. You might hear a little bit of traffic going by. Uh, but, but it's better to be outside. It's better to be outside. It feels good. So thank you for coming up. And yeah, thanks. We're, yeah, we're talking about the book that you just finished the manuscript for. This hasn't even been typeset yet. Yeah. Yeah, it's a brief theological introduction to Alma chapters 1 through 29. Yes. So how did you wind up with that particular section? You know, they called and, well, they called and said, do you want to be part of the project? And I'm assuming they knew that I would want to choose Alma, and that's why they asked. So, how do, how do you think they knew you'd want Alma? Because I have a small obsession with Alma. <laughs> <laughs> Tell I've us been, about that. I've that's interesting. Writing and studying him for years, and um, I, I think they were looking for someone who had a background because the project was going to go so quickly. So they wanted someone who's already been studying and had something to say. And what you did was you brought your training along with you. So you're an adjunct instructor in English at Brigham Young University. Talk a little bit about your academic background. Okay, and this might be a surprise too. <laughs> My undergraduate work was in political science. And then I have a master's degree in American studies. And uh, originally began teaching at UVU for a couple years. And then I moved up to the BYU Honors Department and taught the Honors Freshman First Year Writing. And I should say Utah Valley University is UVU. Yes. For the, for the yes. folks outside of Utah. <laughs> um, and then a while ago, moved to the English Department. And there, for the last number of years, I've taught the literature of the LDS people, which has been a fantastic course. And I do a significant portion on the Book of Mormon as literature. Hmm. And, you know, things just sort of came together for me. At a certain point in time, I took a summer class from Grant Hardy and started encountering and meeting some people like Joe Spencer and Adam Miller. And and that was only people. a few years ago, right? Was that when Grant Hardy came to Brigham Young University yes. and did the summer thing? So he came out, for people that don't know, he came out to sort of do a test run of a study edition that eventually became the Maxwell Institute study edition. And exactly. you were part of that. You got to sit in I with was. That. I was. And it was. it's strange how it all happened. I didn't know him. I didn't know much about him. Um, and it just had this feeling that I really, really wanted to take that class and kind of nudged my way in and happily <laughs> he allowed me to come sit in that course, um, which was a, just an amazing experience. And then uh, within a month, the English department had had someone fall through for teaching this course and asked me kind of last minute if I would do it. And here I had some great ideas having just gone through that course yeah. and been so excited about it to implement in my own course. What a good primer that was. I, I still think about some of those sessions that we had. Grant Hardy did a fantastic job. That was a lot of fun. It was so great. It was amazing. Really an amazing experience. He would teach for an hour and then people would sit around and talk for yeah. another hour yeah. or two after <laughs> the class was over. That's kind of what we hope these books do as well. These brief theological introductions are supposed to spark conversations. They're supposed to get people thinking about things. It's not supposed to be comprehensive. It's supposed to be an introduction. Talk about the idea of an introduction when it comes to a book of scripture. People might be surprised when they pick up my introduction. If they think it's going to be some sort of overview of Alma 1 through 29, they'll be really surprised. Because it is in a sense, but it's also not in a sense. When I'm thinking about an introduction, I'm also thinking about how to approach scripture. So, if anything, this is a, a different approach to Scripture, a different way to read Scripture. So, the introduction is more of a, 
let me introduce you to an approach to read, how to read Alma 1 through 29. I'm not going to just lecture you on everything that's in Alma 1 through 29. You can read it. You can figure that out. I liked this in your introduction where you said, the invitation of this book is quite simple. Read a few Book of Mormon stories that you've probably read before and see them in a new light. As you think about what those stories mean, you'll be thinking about God. And that, at its most basic, is theology. Yes. I'm, I'm glad you picked up on that. What it means to me is that there's a lot of people who are doing theology every day. So we don't need to be scared of that word. We don't need to think, oh, this is something special for really smart people. You think about God. I think about God, especially in, you know, some of the situations that are going on right now with the pandemic worldwide. There's a lot of people thinking about God probably more than they were a few months ago. And that is theology. And then you also say that theology, the thought itself also isn't the end goal. That's not enough. You invite people to think about what we do with theology aside from just thought. So there's, there's an idea that's coming about uh, that they, they term practical theology. And I probably lean in that direction. I'm not, I'm kind of a pseudo-academic, I guess, in a way. <laughs> aren't um, we all? Aren't we all? And so, to me, just someone who wants to sit in an ivory tower and think about thinking, or, or think about thinking about God, that's not going to go very far for me. I want something that applies to my real life, something I can actually do something with. And I think that's where a lot of readers are as well. The Book of Mormon invites that kind of approach, as you point out in your introduction. The Book of Mormon is a collection of stories, it's narratives, and we find theology through stories. What do you think the benefits are? Instead of just having a list of propositional claims, God is like this, this is what you do, A, B, C, D, E. We have stories about people. What do you see as beneficial about that? That is a great question. Stories are different than a list of commands or a list of doctrine. They're very natural to who we are. We tell stories to make sense of our reality, and they told stories as scripture. It's, it's kind of a unique, yes, there's stories in the Bible, of course, but we have a unique approach to scripture from the first word of I, Nephi. This is going to be a personal story. Our history is, is enmeshed from the first vision onward. We've been told to keep our stories, to keep track of them, and that is what our scripture is. A story is different than a list of commands in that it invites the reader in. Most of us, when we read a story, identify with a character and are very dramatically changed. You know, there's all sorts of studies and brain scans and neurological things and imaging where they see that people actually feel emotion in connection with what the characters are feeling. Stories change us and they change us deeply, probably more deeply, well, according to research, they change people more deeply and for longer than trying to force yourself to follow a list of commandments. And in your work, you say that you strive to show respect for the text as scripture. That word really stood out to me, showing respect. What does that mean to you when you show respect to scripture? I, I don't want to do violence to the scripture. I want to respect the story. How does one do violence? What would that look like? Twisting it, making the, making the words say what you want them to mean, pulling verses out of context and imposing a reading on them. I don't think that that's always wrong. I think that there's even readings that can be inspired mm. where Heavenly Father says, you know, look at this verse in a new light and no, it doesn't really fit the context, but this is how I need it to work for you in your life right yeah. now. But when I'm reading for something like this, I'm looking at the story. I'm looking at the context, trying to make sense of why someone would say these words at this time in this way. Yeah, so your method's very tuned to the context. You're looking at what's happening in the stories and what's happening around them. And we'll get into this more. I, I don't want to get ahead of, of ourselves yet, but people will see when we talk about Alma chapter 29, which is a very famous chapter where Alma says, oh, that I were an angel. When you put that in its context, there's some stunning things that you pull out. I'm, I'm looking forward to talking about that with you. So one other thing about your introduction is that it concludes on a note of warning. 
you say the lessons that we find in Alma chapter 1 through 29 aren't trite. They're not easy, even, you say. And so you invite readers to prepare to encounter some losses as they're reading or, or some challenges. I want to hear more about that. That's what I found in Alma. And I think that's why I'm so focused on his life story and who he is. He's become very real to me. And as we're invited into reading his story, if we identify with him and read it deeply, we encounter in some small way the same losses that he encountered. And that changes you. So readers need to be prepared. This isn't a mind exercise. This is a mind and a heart exercise, and we will be changed. Well, let's go to chapter one of your book. You talk about the common understanding of Alma's conversion as kind of a coming-of-age story. You mm-hmm. say that the story is emotionally compelling, fairly predictable, and relatively undemanding when we read it that way. What is this basic gist of story? What do you think the general impression is of people that read through Alma the first time? What do they get out of his narrative on a surface level? On a surface level, it's a nice story. And don't get me wrong. I mean, it's it's a good story. It's a compelling story. Here is the uh, sort of, you know, we have a stereotype of like a leader's son, a bishop's bad boy son, you know, someone who's rebelling. <laughs> the a rebellious bit. teenager. Exactly. This rebellious teenager who sees an angel, repents, and lives a good life after this, you know, follows in his father's footsteps. That's a good story. And it can be very comforting for parents who have teens rebelling in the same way or going even teens who are just being teens perhaps (laughs) yeah just it seems so regular i mean it's not regular when you're living it in your own life but it's a story that we know yeah we've heard this story yeah Mm -hmm. sure but you challenge that you call readers attention to some possibilities in the text that challenge this reading you call readers attention to how time works for example that that time in stories can be manipulated it can be fast forwarded sped up talk about time and and how that helped you see alma in a different way i think one thing that jumped out at me as i started reading more carefully is realizing that alma the younger is never called alma the younger in the Book of Mormon. Yeah, we have this. Where did it come from? Do you know? I have tried to track it down. I cannot figure it's it out. It's not in the Book of Mormon. I've read the Book of Mormon so many times. I, I can't even count how many times I've read it. And I'm, <laughs> I'm reading your manuscript and you say, guess what? Alma the Younger is never said in the Book of Mormon. And I said, that can't be right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. It's right. It's not in there. It's It's not there. And that name in and of itself just, you know, I mean, yes, someone could be someone junior. (laughs) Alma Jr. didn't sound as good, maybe. (laughs) Yeah, you know, or Alma, yeah. And And he he, was younger than the other Alma. He was younger than his father. Yes, he was. (laughs) But by by labeling him like that, and also by some some textual structural things, it's easy for us to believe that he's young, that he's a teenager. And then you start looking at the years and the dates and the timing of things and realize that's kind of a stretch. Mm Mm-hmm. It's just as possible, in fact, more possible that he's older, that he's easily 20s, 30s, 40s, conceivably in his 50s when he repents and is born again. And I think that changes the story for people. It can change it dramatically, just someone's age. What did it change about it for you? All of a sudden, the story is not a simple one. This is not the story of a teenager who's rebelling it's a lot more serious. This is someone who is a man, someone who knows what he's doing, knows what he's thinking, and is doing it deliberately. And it also will have repercussions for his missionary work as well. For years. And that's why I feel uh, that my theological introduction to Alma 1 through 29 has to step back and start with this story of conversion. Because if we've misjudged who Alma is, then all the stories for the rest of his life are different than we thought they were. And we don't get to see stories of him before his conversion. This is something that you point out is that we're introduced to Alma before his conversion experience, but everything we hear about it is kind of just statements of what he was like. We don't see any stories about what he was like. No stories, and especially no first person rhetoric. The first words we hear this man who's known for his rhetoric 
known for speaking amazingly well. The first words that we hear him say are that he's been born again and has changed his mind and is righteous. So here's this, this man whose flattery is, is well known, who's been leading many people out of the church. And we don't have one word of those persuasive, powerful words. We don't know anything that he says directly. It's just summarized briefly. What do you think about that? I mean, we, the record keeper here, the abridger, the person who's putting these stories together, made a choice there to not bring us into the scenes of pre-conversion Alma. What do you think about that? I've, I've wondered through different ideas, and there, there could be multiple reasons why. Everything from space to availability. Maybe Alma didn't write those words. Um, maybe they weren't kept. I've kind of settled on the idea that I'm not sure Mormon trusted us. I'm not sure he thought we could handle it. He wants, he needs us to have some of these powerful sermons, Alma 5, Alma 7, I mean, some of the most amazing doctrine of the atonement that we have. And he very well might have been worried that we would discount it, that we wouldn't read it as carefully if it came from someone who was as wicked as Alma, and deliberately so. It gets difficult here in chapter two. You invite readers to spend more time thinking about pre-conversion Alma, and you say that doing that won't be for the faint-hearted, but for the broken-hearted. Some people might say, why should we focus on the negative past of his? Why should we focus on his mistakes or his errors, look at historical warts? Why do that? In this case, because the stereotype is accurate on one thing, well, on many things, but the stereotype of a teenager who's born again, the born again part is still true. It is still real. And it is more powerful if this isn't a little teenager having a teenage moment. You know, this little rebel without a cause kind of thing. Can God redeem people who are dedicating themselves contrary to him? Who are convincing many other people to go contrary to him, leading them out of the church of God. Later he calls it, he tells, he says that he murdered their souls. And I think he means it. And he is devastated to learn just how wrong he was. You actually place him alongside some of these other Book of Mormon figures. We think of Korahor and Nehor and these type of people, these typical antichrists that are sort of stereotyped and a little, a little one-dimensional maybe. They just kind of seem like these villainous people. With Alma, he, he, apparently he was one of those. He, that's the category that he came from. I think it's easy to overlook that. It's really easy to overlook that. And like I said, in part, it's because of structural things. This, this part of the story is in the Book of Mosiah. And as soon as we turn the page, we're in the Book of Alma. And he is righteous there. Mm -hmm. He's consistently righteous. He's got a book, you know, the book's named Alma. Exactly. What's interesting is that we don't change over, even though the record keeper, his son, takes over. But so we've we, got... He got a book named after him. He's, he's got, got to be a good guy. <laughs> and he's, he has 45 chapters of good, positive, amazing doctrine kind of scripture. So, I, I mean, I'm joking, but if you read a chapter a night... You spend so much time, over well over a month, mm. with righteous Alma. But he's called an unbeliever in the text. And, and you say that's, that term, you look at it as more than just saying a person who doesn't believe. You see more to that term as how it works in the Book of Mormon. Yes, yes. Because the original chaptering, and I think you've mentioned another podcast that the chapters that we have were done by Orson Pratt. 1879 he yes. chopped it up <laughs> yeah he chopped it up in 1879 which is great it makes it easier to follow in a lot of ways shorter chapters if you want to do a chapter a day he you can thank he made Orson it Pratt. a lot yeah. <laughs> easier but what it does is cut into the narrative it chops up the story the story that we're meant to read holistically so the end of mosiah is a is one story together um and it includes the the chapter before Alma's conversion story and it's in that chapter where we learn about the unbelievers these are the children who did not take the covenant 
with King Benjamin's people. They were too young. But they grow up and they don't believe. The, the text is actually very clear. And looking at them and, and reading over the list of what they don't believe, they don't believe in the traditions of the fathers. They don't believe in Christ. They don't believe that we can know of things to come. They don't want to labor with their own hands. It's kind of an odd... I can relate to that. <laughs> <laughs> an odd addition, but it, it, becomes, it becomes meaningful. And you study the Book of Mormon looking for laboring with your own hands. It's there. It's all over. Um, and, it's, and it's connected to this type of to mentality. To this unbeliever yeah. mentality. So from, from that beginning, from this group, the, the dynamics of that Nephite society is changed. At first, they're a minority, but then they convert people or unconvert people from the Church of God into this unbelief, this challenging. And it, it almost becomes a, a religion of itself. I mean, it, granted, it's an anti-religion, an anti— Well, yeah, but it has a worldview. It has missionaries of sorts. It has an ideology. It has, exactly. It, I would— you know, the Book of Mormon doesn't get too much into it, but it, but it has probably social codes and, and sort of ways of, of acting and maybe even dressing, all sorts of things. It, it seems like it. It seems like it does. They're, they are opposed to the Church of God, and if the Church of God wants to wear humble clothing, then they'll wear a different attire, and they'll set up churches for themselves, like Nihor. The interesting thing is that what we know of Antichrist, except for Sherem, who comes in the book of Jacob, all of the Antichrists come in these first years of the reign of the judges when Alma is the chief judge. Yeah, we don't see him later in the Book of Mormon. What do you make of that? They're kind of concentrated at this moment of Nephite history. I think what we can potentially see, and I grant you that all of these things can be challenged, but I, I think... It, Alma is labeled as an unbeliever, clearly, and he's clearly teaching others and leading them astray, bringing them out of the church on purpose. And it says that the Book of Mormon says that he's leading them away and trying to teach them to do after the manner of his iniquities. And there was the day I was pondering that and realizing, oh, his iniquities is not, it's not just being an unbeliever, it's leading others others to be unbelievers that's that's a difference that's a big difference it's not just a passive group of people who don't believe right it's, and you have to look at like what they're unbelieving in like the covenant that was made back in mosiah had to do with mourning with those that mourn bearing one another's burdens seeking for equality in the society and and things like this and, and here we have a group when we're talking about unbelievers it's not just a stereotype of someone who's like oh i don't believe god exists or something something stereotypical exactly. it's very specific in the book of mormon it's almost just not wanting to be a part of a social contract it's it's almost sort of a gross individualism of i don't i don't need to be part of this society i don't want to mourn with those that mourn i don't want to to uh participate in society in these ways it's not a, it's not this simple matter of unbelief of just not believing something exactly it, it is not i mean i guess in a sense it's the church of god is seeking for this communal zion kind of approach if you will and the unbelievers are pushing back against that at every turn. Let's, no, in, instead of everyone participating and working, I'm not going to work with my, you should, you should have a hierarchy. I shouldn't have to work because I'm going to preach and teach you. Um, and there's differences. There's differences as it plays out between the various antichrists. But at the core are the same basic mm unbeliever ideals, unbeliever theology, way of approaching God, that are just playing out over and over and over again. It, it must be tragic. You know, one of the last things Alma does, and this is outside of my section, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies to Mark Rathall, who uh, does the next <laughs> second half of Alma. Is talk to his own son, Corey Anton. And it's about the same the same, they, they don't believe concerning the resurrection of the dead. We're not sure what the unbelievers don't believe, but this same concern about the resurrection for the dead comes up over and over. And some of our most amazing doctrine 
is Alma trying to explain to his own son why we believe in the resurrection of the dead. And one of the fascinating things about that, too, is that Alma doesn't have all the information about it. He doesn't have all the details either. This is one of the most obvious examples in Scripture. And maybe I'll, and maybe I'll ask Mark about this as well. This is one of the most obvious examples of Scripture of canonized speculation. He says, I'm not quite sure about this. Here's what I think. It's canonized. Yeah. This is Scripture that's like, I'm not sure about this. And I love his careful delineation of that. This is what I know. Now I'm going to step over the line here and tell you what I don't know, but what I think, um, being very deliberately careful to clarify which one is which. And the fact that, that, that Scripture can do that, I think, is something to think about. That Scripture can have speculation, can have theological exploration. And again, it, it wouldn't be so surprising if we realized that Scripture is story. This is someone's personal writing. This is someone's story. It's an amazing person with great wisdom who's seen angels, but it is still a, a story. That's Kylie Nelson Turley. We're talking to her today about her brief theological introduction to the first half of Alma, Alma chapters 1 through 29. So we've spent some time thinking about pre-conversion Alma. Then this, this angel comes to Alma, and he relates the story several times in some of your book is dedicated to unpacking the different versions and the different mm -hmm. ways he retells the story. But in one of them, in, in Alma chapter 36, the angel says a very strange sentence. Yeah. And, and here's the sentence. He says, if thou wilt be destroyed of thyself, comma, seek no more to destroy the church of God. Okay, so this is a really strange <laughs> grammatical construction. If it, it seems like an incomplete sentence, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of do yous instead of thous. It helps if you will be destroyed of yourself, seek no more to destroy the church of God. So, wait a minute. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like, the if you want to be destroyed, stop attacking the church? What yeah, have we got it doesn't, here? <laughs> it doesn't, that one has bothered me for years. And I just sat there and looked at it and I think... And you looked at a bunch of scholars, what a bunch of scholars yeah. had said about it. Because this, this has it, been it, a point of focus. Exactly. And I don't know why I would never noticed it, except that we read so casually sometimes. I think you solved it. Yeah. Tell, Thank you. What's your solution? I just want to change the punctuation. Changing the punctuation solves this. We've there's many scholars and who are probably much more knowledgeable than me and go through great contortions, even if you will, to try to solve this problem because that doesn't make sense. No. Just a surface reading of that nope. scripture does not make sense. If you'll be destroyed of yourself then stop trying to destroy the church. It should go one way or the other. If you want to be destroyed, keep, keep destroying. Right. You just go ahead and keep destroying the church <laughs> of God. Or if you don't want to be destroyed, then, then stop. stop. <laughs> but you can actually just change the punctuation a little bit, and it makes sense. Yeah, what have you got? So, really, simply, you can change the, the punctuation to say, if thou wilt, comma, of thyself be destroyed, period seek no more to destroy the church of god so if you want to go ahead be destroyed alma yeah do do what you do do what you do do it your way but, but stop stop trying in fact not even church. but stop it's just seek stop. no more yeah, just this stop. is a straightforward command stop hmm. um and even though this is said in many different versions the same sort of light punctuation changes can clarify all of them 36, 9, 36, 11. And the interesting thing is redoing the punctuation aligns with what the angel actually said at the beginning in 27, 13. The angel quotes the Lord as saying, this is my church and I will establish it and nothing shall overthrow it save it is the transgression of my people. So you don't really get this option, Alma. You're not going to overthrow my church. Yeah, it's it's not saying like, hey, please don't destroy our church. It's basically saying you can't, you can't. If by doing this, you can only hurt yourself. You will, you'll only end up hurting yourself in the very end, basically. Exactly. He's he just says, and not a, even this is your last chance. That was your last yeah, chance. This You're is done. A, it's a great and elegant solution, and, and we should uh, remind listeners: the Book of Mormon punctuation came from the typesetter. Uh, who was a brilliant man, he did a great clearly, job. Yeah. an amazing job. Uh, and he wasn't, he never became uh, 
member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He he was just a, a worker. He he punctuated the book as he typeset it because there was as no punctuation. As he typeset, <laughs> which is incredible. Just for fun, sometimes in my class, I, I pulled all the punctuation out of Alma 13. I remember doing this with Grant Hardy. This was one of the days where he had us <laughs> yeah. punctuate something. Well, and I, I chose Alma 13 because I think it's probably the most difficult chapter. And I have yet to get to the end of that chapter and have punctuation fall in line and make sense. I cannot figure that <laughs> chapter out at all. It's very convoluted. So the fact that the this employee at the Grandin print shop did punctuation on the fly <laughs> is amazing. But I think in this case, we could alter it just a little bit and things would make sense. Yeah, so this is one of the things that, that I would recommend to listeners in their Book of Mormon study is take some time to try to repunctuate some things. And you might come up with some really interesting readings or notice new things. I don't. I haven't seen this solution you offered for Alma 36. I, I, I haven't seen this anywhere else. I think I think this is the solution. To me, it's the the most obvious little solution. Yes, there's Hebrew forms that I don't even understand that perhaps that that's the solution or other types of understanding and impl implications and assumptions of other words that might be included but this is an easy one yeah. this is so easy and it makes sense all right so um many of the problems as we mentioned before many of the problems that alma faced during his ministry you say probably resulted from his own life and in, in the things that he did before he was converted. What does that suggest to you about repentance? I mean, he could repent, but there were these ongoing things that he was dealing with. You know, that is, I think that's a difficult thing. And we don't want to believe repentance is this way. We want to think you repent and it's roses and happiness from here on out. And maybe it is in God's eyes. But the problem is, you wake up tomorrow, and even if you've repented, other people might not believe you. They might not think you really changed. You still have to live with the consequences of the choices that you made. You know, I think an easy example for people to understand is, is maybe immorality. And if there was a child that came from immorality, you can, of course you can repent. You wake up tomorrow, and there's still a child to take care of. And sometimes that can even become a, a wonderful thing. It's, it, repentance isn't, isn't so easy when you get down to these really specific circumstances. It's, it's true that God can turn things. That's one of my favorite words in the scriptures is turning. He can turn things for our good in amazing ways, even horrible, awful experiences that happen or that we cause or that someone causes to us he can turn them for our good you also speculate that and as you mentioned before that uh, sometimes people won't believe you that, you that you've repented you, you speculate based on something in alma 45 that there was a lot of questions that people had questions about who alma really was even years after the fact because the record keeper whose voice is uncertain we don't quite know who is saying this we're right? not sure entirely S says it's probably his son so alma disappears which is really strange we don't know what happens to him and then whoever's keeping this record says this we know that he was a righteous man and this is in a whole list of what we don't know he's gone we don't know where we don't know what happened to him maybe he did this maybe he did that but this we know he was a righteous man. And if there was any question, would you even have to make that kind of no, a declaration, right? Absolutely not. You wouldn't have to declare it so, so straightforwardly. But what we forget is even though we've had 45 chapters, which in the Book of Mormon could be hundreds and hundreds of years, but in this case, it's only 19 years. Yeah, time really, really zooms in through this section of the Book of Mormon. People that have heard the earlier episodes and read the earlier books in the series will see that. That, I mean, Sharon Harris's yeah. books, the little books that she did cover such a longer period of time in so many fewer words. Exactly. So he's, we've, time has slowed down and, and that's another reason why we might misjudge him because this is, this is only 19 years from chapter one to chapter 45. 
you, we think we know Alma, but we only know roughly two decades of his life. And his we don't father, even know where he went. We, we don't, although, although we have an idea. He's last seen walking toward Melek. And Melek is on the way to Ammonihah. Hmm. I think. Why is that significant? Ammonihah is a, a critical changing moment. And it's, it's one of the most horrific stories of the Book of Mormon. Let's talk about that. I mean, your next chapter is called The Cry of Mourning Was Heard. You're going to talk about mourning. You're going to talk about difficulty. And wow, so we last see him heading toward Ammonihah. Let's, let's unpack that a bit. He, he resigns the judgment seat and just goes off on a missionary journey to try to preach the word. He thinks he can, he can more effectively help people, help them repent if he tries this other route, because he's just been dealing again from day one on the judgment seat with the uh, with unbelievers, with antichrists, and so he heads off to Ammonihah, and it does not go well, <laughs> not at all. He he walks in, begins preaching. We don't have his first words, but they they respond very very poorly. They know who he is. They make it very clear. Yeah, we know who you who you are, and we have no respect for you. And who do you think you are? And who do you think you are, and who does God think he is? It's it's stunning to me if you put that in context. He is he hasn't he was just chief judge of the whole Nephite society. And he walks into this village and they say, Get out. We don't care who you were, who you are. We and we know. So get out. And he does. They throw him out of the city. Um, and he's just upset and worried about their salvation. And an angel, his angel, reappears and tells him to go back. He immediately turns around and goes back. But he goes back by another way into the city. I think he knows that he's, he's walking back into a hostile, horrible situation but he doesn't know how bad it's going to be. He doesn't realize how horrible the situation is going to turn out to be. He meets up with Amulek. They spend some amount of time together in Amulek's home, and then they begin preaching. And the story, it, it just escalates. Everything he says, the people respond overly much to. They're, they're extremely hostile. We have no words, and the fir their first response is, we know who you are, get out. And and he seems to escalate, too. He does. He escalates, but every time they overreact. Again, you know, maybe we'll throw you in prison, but let's kill you? Hmm. I mean, it's just, it seems overboard. I think they're responding to something besides Alma himself. If we, if we... This is one of those stories that looks different if we believe Alma is the unbeliever that I, that I think he was. That's, they're responding to that. This accounts for that seemingly over-the-top response. His history His helps history. account for their reaction. These, these people are not just, again, apostates who don't believe in anything. Look at the questions they're asking. Look at what they're discussing with him. They absolutely believe in a theology, and they think they're doing things right. Mm -hmm. And that theology, again, aligns with those unbelievers. So did Alma know them before? Did Alma teach them before? It's possible. And so when he comes back with his new church of God, they call it his church. Mm -hmm. They're kind of accusing him of setting up his own church of God. They don't want anything to do with it. And they are extremely hostile, extremely mad, to the point where they take his words, they take Amulek's words, and they they do exactly what Alma has said. He, he preached that if they wouldn't repent, their torment would be as if it were a lake of fire and brimstone. And Amulek said, if you throw out the righteous from among you, God will destroy you. So, Amulek, here, we'll show you how much we care about what you think. We'll throw out the righteous. See what we can do? And by the way, the fire and brimstone thing, 
This this is horrifying. This really. is absolutely horrifying. In Alma 14, we have this moment where Alma and Amulek are brought before the fire. And there's a little verb tense change in there that makes it clear that they are standing before the fire as it is burning people. Most of it's written in the past tense, but there's little changes that let you know they're in front of the fire as the people are consuming in the fire. So they're seeing their converts, women and children, and scriptures be burned. We never hear of Amulek's family again. There's a very good chance that Amulek's family are burned in front of him. And they, they sit there stunned, stunned and in shock. And as the fire finishes burning, the chief judge comes over and stands before Alma and Amulek and he slaps them. And there's enough slapping that goes on in this, this episode that you can tell it's a, a hostile, demeaning experience. He slaps him and says, After what ye have seen, will you preach again unto this people that they shall be cast into a lake of fire and brimstone? This is direct, it's pointed, and it's mocking Alma, mocking his words that he preached. He was the one who said, if you don't repent, you'll suffer as if you were in a lake of fire and brimstone. So they say, look what we can do, Alma. Thanks we for the great idea, basically. Exactly. We will build a lake of fire and brimstone. I wonder if he felt any blame i mean he he'd, he'd introduced that language yeah that's what becomes compelling to me they don't answer him then and i don't know if they're stunned into silence if this is a inspired choice not to answer i kind of wonder if they they literally are speechless after what they've seen and we don't hear them talk again for a while you point out five years right is that the amount of time they they speak a little in the prison but then it goes silent. Really, Alma, we don't have any public sermons, any public rhetoric for five years, but on anything, but on the lake of fire and brimstone. And this is comprised. Uh, it's changed how I read the Book of Mormon to realize that after this chief judge slaps him and says, will you preach again of a lake of fire and brimstone? The answer is no, never again. Not in the rest of the Book of Mormon. We will never say those words again. Hmm. And they don't. No one does. Not just them. No one. Hmm. It's been used multiple times before. By many people. King Benjamin, Jacob, Nephi. But we're not going to say this. How did that feel when you, when you found that out? I've, I've never seen that pointed out before. That the phrase literally disappears. How was that when you found that? I just sat there weeping and realizing how painful this experience was for him and also realizing that others recognize that pain. I, I don't know that you could get a whole society on board with, oh yeah, we don't say that anymore. But could a careful editor say, we're not going to say that anymore and take it out of the rest of the book. Yes. Someone recognized his pain. Someone recognized what the oh, horrific, I can't even think of the words, horrible moment this was to watch people be burned alive because of an unfortunate metaphor. It's horrible. And it scars him. And this is the context in which you put Alma chapter 29, which we t tend to read in isolation. You just go right to Alma 29. It's a, it's a very beautiful and inspirational, poetic, one of the most poetic parts of the Book of Mormon. Even a song. <laughs> yes, even a song. But it happens in this context. It's the tail end of the silence that, that you say Alma undertakes for those five years where we don't see him preaching publicly. And then suddenly he comes out with this. So you place it in the context of perhaps even a mourning ritual. Mourning is in sorrow, not, yes. not, not mourning daytime. Mourning for death. Yeah. 
and uh, destruction. Give us some, some more information about that, about Alma chapter 29 in this, in this context of tragedy and trauma. I, th- I think there are good reasons to believe that Alma was traumatized um, by what happened at Ammonihah and things <laughs> much less threatening. Even the perception of threat can cause trauma for people. And, and one of the typical, atypical reaction can be an inability to speak about the traumatic happening. Um, it, it's so beyond what you could conceive of, beyond your experience, that you literally cannot put words on the experience. And what's interesting is if we read Alma 29, there's multiple phrases that suggest Ammonihah even from the very beginning, that he says, he, uh, Oh, that I were an angel and could have the wish of mine heart. There's only one other place in Scripture where someone has a wish of their heart, and that's Alma at the end of his speech at Ammonihah. And this plan of redemption, that crying repentance, even this idea of an angel coming and speaking to all the ends of the earth, there's, there's a multiple little phrases throughout the first part of Alma 29 that are reminiscent of Ammonihah. He's taken back for this first time that we have recorded a public speaking after Ammonihah. He's right back in that moment again. Hmm. And you see it in all these textual echoes. And you say that this follows a biblical style, a Hebrew style of lament. There are these steps that scholars have identified that you can find in Psalms. Uh, what, are, what are some examples of those where you see this as a f- ritualized almost expression? It is. It's, it's a form. It's a, you know, we have poetry that's very form- formulaic, formatted like a sonnet. The limerick. The limerick. <laughs> um, and a psalm follows a certain form. It follows a, a a knowable format. There's been a lot of biblical research on Psalms, and they, you know, there's different ideas and different steps, but most people trace back to one known format with five steps by Hermann Gunkel, is the biblical scholar that everyone would hark back to. And a psalm of lament usually starts with an abrupt invocation, just quick, brief, to the point, which is different than other types of psalms. A psalm of praise might go on and on, oh God, the great and glorious, you know, something like that. Wonderful are your ways, etc. Exactly, yeah. which is a beautiful style. Oh yeah, absolutely. But a lament is abrupt, short, might be one word, and that's what we have here, just, oh, <laughs> You know, oh God, you're just crying out. And after the invocation, they typically move into the complaint or the lament. This is what's wrong. And they're, and they're very honest and like, they're not pulling punches. This is what we find in, in the Bible. They don't sugarcoat things. They speak directly and frankly to God about what the problem is. Absolutely. They, it, people might be shocked if they start studying the biblical Psalms carefully you know, break the teeth of the ungodly and, oh God, where are you? Like, where the heck are you? I mean, it's, the language is very blunt like that. It's, it's, it's a bold way to deal with it. And scripture is saying this is a way that people who love and believe in God sometimes feel like interacting with God. Yeah. Angry. Some of them are angry. Some of them are hostile, accusatory, uh, they're very, very real. And I think we might hesitate to approach God that way. But the Spirit testifies of truth, maybe even the truth of how we're feeling. Hmm. And I, I don't think we have such a wimpy God as one who can't handle your pain. Hmm. Our God can. He's... He can. And approaching him that way with pure honesty can be an important step in healing. Right. So we have that invocation. We have the complaint, the lament. Then you say there's a pivot. Yeah. 
So there's there's a couple of these changes and transitional periods. Um, and what's intriguing to me is that that what we have in Alma 29 follows the format of Second Nephi 4 in these pivots. So we he laments, and it's hard to believe it's a lament because oh that I were an angel. You're thinking that just sounds like a nice little wish. You know, is this really a lament? Yeah, in this context, it is. In this context, he's saying, why couldn't I have more power? Why couldn't I bring these people to repentance? Like the angel came to me, and look what happened. I came to Ammonihah, and look what happened. Look what happened. I couldn't, I didn't do I, it like the angel. I yeah. not only didn't save them, but I caused a worse mm -hmm. And it causes a harsh word. What happened was a worse horror than anything I could have imagined. He might have even felt like he helped cause it too. Like, yeah, we don't know. We don't know. He he does he doesn't say, but that's that's a reasonable thing that someone might feel about themselves if yeah. if they were in that kind of a circumstance. Absolutely. And if only I was ah, if I was an angel. And this then, is what I wish you know. This ah, if I could have done this. And he's harking back to Ammonihah, but in context here. Alma 29 is spoken after Alma 28. And in Alma 28, we have the worst war since Lehi left Jerusalem. This war gets overshadowed because we don't have battle scenes. We don't have much of a discussion of it. It's, it's fairly well downplayed. But there are thousands of people who are dead. Thousands of bodies laying on the earth moldering in heaps. And it's in this context that, that Alma 29 is spoken. If this is not a happy wish when he says he wants to cr declare the plan of salvation, that there might not be more sorrow on the face of the earth. There is a lot of sorrow right now. And he wishes he could have done anything to change that. This is, this is a, a sad statement, a, a very much of a lament. And people that read the book will get to see you unpack that even more to talk about how the psalm can be read through this lens. It's a really helpful chapter. We're talking with Kylie Nielsen Turley about her book, A Brief Theological Introduction, uh, and she covered Alma chapters 1 through 29. So uh, the last chapter I wanted to focus on here is talking about the different lenses that people use when they read scripture. You mm -hmm. use this metaphor of, of sort of putting, putting on different glasses. Uh, and seeing things differently. Right, and that different people kind of have, can have different prescriptions, different prescription lenses. You might uh -huh. put some things on and see something different. So when we read scripture, it's important, I think, to remember that everybody's bringing their own eyes to the text. And instead of trying to make everybody agree with my particular view, I can benefit from listening to the views of other people. Because those can all be accurate, real views. So when I come to the scriptures and maybe my background or my culture or my, my context is something about social justice, then those are the questions I'm asking. And that will pull social justice into view. And those, when I bring those questions, those are the answers that I start to see, that I find, maybe more so than someone else who brought a different question. Yeah, and you do this in the context of Abish in particular, uh -huh. one of the few women who are named in the Book of Mormon. So talk about Abish in view of that social justice lens, for example. You, you bring several lenses in this chapter, say, mm -hmm. if we ask these questions, here's what we might see in Abish. If we ask these questions, here's what we might learn from Abish. So talk about that a little bit. So we have Abish who, for all intents and purposes, has no power. She shouldn't have any power in the society. She's a servant. She's a servant. And we grant you, servant in the royal household, maybe there's a tiny bit of power there, but she's a woman in a society that seems to clearly revolve around men. Um, so much so that women are rarely even given names in the record and so on. Six women of name, mm -hmm. three of them not even characters in this book just references just to references other women to yeah. eve to mary mm -hmm. you know, biblical references and here abish has a name but she's also called lamanitish we have no idea what that means yeah. i cannot that's find the only person right that's the servants so the, the servants there are, are lamanitish servants okay. who go to watch the flocks which ammon becomes 
uh, one of those watchers. And then Abish is Lamanitish. We don't know what that means, yeah. but what it clearly means is she's not one or the other. She's not Lamanite. She's not Nephite. She's marginal, even she's more. She's marginal. Yeah. Always a marginal, uh, not powerful person. And what would a social justice lens pull out of that? I mean, you're kind of in looking closely at her status in society and seeing... Then this is stunning. This is amazing. This is the least powerful person in the society. She's not even in the society. She's on the fringes. She's a Lamanitish woman, servant. She should not be able to accomplish anything at all. And yet she does. She changes things in a powerful way. I'm, I'm stunned. And, and clearly she deserves a name because of what she accomplishes. She changes the society. People listen to her. It's a stunning moment. You suggest that she's even a, a Christ figure. She becomes a, a Christ figure. She pulls people together and in a significant way, uh, she raises the queen. So we have this moment where King Lamoni has collapsed. He's also a Christ figure. And I think sometimes we get a little too attached to uh, reading that, you know, says this person's this, this person's that. But we can have multiple Christ figures in the same story. It's okay. <laughs> so Lamoni collapses, revives, and then speaks briefly to his wife, which is a lovely moment in Scripture. She is the first person he turns to, reaches out for her. Before he's even up off his bed, he's reaching out towards his wife. And then they both collapse. And then the servants collapse. Ammon collapses. Everyone is down on the ground. And she runs, runs. To, to gather people, thinking that if they behold this scene, they're, they're going to be converted. But the opposite happens. They start fighting, bickering. One man even tries to kill Ammon, and she realizes this is getting out of control. This is going to turn into a mob. I need to do something. She's sorrowful unto tears about the situation that she unintentionally created with the best of intentions and reaches out and takes the queen by the hand. And the way this is described just stands out to me. It could, could it be that she's just helping someone up from the ground? Yes, of course, that's a literal reading, that could be reality. But the way it's described, and then it's described in exactly the same words again, makes it something else. She touches the queen's hand and the woman instantly revives. The queen rises not just from falling to the earth. It makes it sound like she's spiritually reborn from the fall, not a fall. She raises someone from spiritual death. Uh, Abish does. I think she's very much of a Christ figure in that context. And the full chapter goes on to unpack even more things about Abish. Uh, I encourage people to check that out when the book becomes available. There's one moment here in this chapter that I want to remember, that I want to keep with me. I want to keep it with me in Sunday school. I want to keep it with me in academic settings. You say that it's an important question to ask what this story means, but it might even be more important to ask what else does it mean? That we can find these different meanings and that we should keep asking, and what else can this mean? And what else can this mean? And that is what makes scripture so fruitful, is that we can keep asking that. We don't have to have these locked in singular readings of everything, mm -hmm. but we can ask and perhaps should ask, and what else? Yes. My, a good friend of mine, Julie Smith, was the first person who suggested that wording and the idea I'd had before, but I love that the most important question can be, what else does it mean? Hmm. How else can I see this? What other interpretation might there be that God wants me to see? What can I learn from other people? What does Blair have to say? What are his insights about this scripture? So ultimately, this book is shares some of my insights about the scriptures, but that doesn't mean they're the one and only true answer or, that should be seen or even could be seen. Absolutely. I want, there, there are other ways to see it. Scripture is so dense. 
so packed with meaning that I think that's some of the reason that some of what constitutes scripture is this kind of language that God can use to mean so many things to people in their different situations. And you say that for how densely packed the Book of Mormon is, you also observe that in your experience, the Book of Mormon doesn't answer all of the questions that you'd like it to answer, all the questions that it raises even. And in some cases, it raises the hardest questions and leaves the questions to us. I think that's important to realize. I don't know that God works with me the same that he works with other people, but in my experience, sometimes people use the Book of Mormon as if it's a question-answer book, sort of a, uh, you know, just an easy way to, to roll a dice almost and say, is it yes, is it no, you know, what's the answer that's going to come up? And I'll quick pray about this question, flip open the Book of Mormon, put my finger on a scripture, voila, there will be the answer. That hasn't happened for me. Is it the answer holistically? Does it turn me to God? Does it put me in a place where I can pray and feel the Spirit and have answers? Yes. But does it answer the specific questions of my life? Not usually. Not usually. What are some of the questions that the Book of Mormon keeps asking you? I think it asks us to bring our heart to the book. There are every every fast and testimony meeting when we get to have them <laughs> every every time I hear people say they know the Book of Mormon is true and to me this book is an epic tragedy if this book is true and you know it I it's difficult for me to see how you could stand up and casually say I know the book is true this is a heartbreaking book and maybe that's just the questions I'm asking it, but it brings pain, Alma's pain, Amulek's pain, Ammonihah's pain, the pain of every person in the society to the surface and asks us to mourn with those people, to mourn with someone who's mourning in extreme ways and to find that there is a God of healing. And so the Book of Mormon, the truthfulness of the book is in its call to us to learn how to do that work of mourning with Christ. And we, you know, Alma 7, this is why Christ came down and took, him, took a body upon, uh, this is why Christ took upon himself flesh. And, you know, this is what we see in Alma 7, that he could learn how to succor his people according to their infirmities in the flesh. And the book is inviting us to think about how we're supposed to do that as well. And it's probably going to require heart and mind more than we've allowed it to require before. It, will, it can call you to think, call you to feel. Probably whichever side you err on, this is personal theory of mine that if you're a thinking person this book might call you to feel to feel someone else's pain if you're a feeling person this book might call you to think think harder think deeper this is not just a knee-jerk reaction of emotion it asks us to become more to feel more to think more to be more awake and alert to other people in ways that we haven't been. Hmm. That's Kylie Nielsen Turley. She's the author of Alma Chapter 1 through 29, A Brief Theological Introduction. It's part of the Neil A. Maxwell Institute's Brief Theological Introductions to the Book of Mormon series. That series is ongoing. Um, we're trying to get volumes out as best we can as the pandemic continues people can get updates about the series on our social media accounts also at our website mi.byu.edu slash brief uh, we don't have an estimated date of when uh, this particular book on alma will come out but we'll keep people posted uh, online kylie thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today about your new book i'm really looking forward to seeing it in print Thank you. I appreciate your time. I appreciate your backyard. It's beautiful. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for being here. Especially that crow was distracting me. Crow?
<laughs> okay. So Gee, you. That's the crow. <laughs> it did. It totally did. And it flew right over us. Okay. Uh, Thank you. All right. We'll see you. Thanks for listening to another episode about the brief theological introductions to the Book of Mormon. Next up in this series of interviews, we'll talk to Mark Rathall from the University of Oxford. He covered the second part of Alma. Before we go, here's a recent review of the podcast in Apple Podcasts. This one comes from Kiwi Springs, who calls the show inspired and thought-provoking. They say, The series on the theological introductions to the Book of Mormon has left me with four to five thought-provoking and faith-affirming insights each episode. One of the reasons I stay in the Latter-day Saint faith is its intellectual richness, and no series or place has done a better job of providing an anchor and making me excited than the Maxwell Institute. Well, thanks for the kind words, Kiwi Springs. I appreciate that. Uh, we also have an old review here. This one comes from someone called E. Wayne ninety one. Uh, here's the review. They gave us one star, so this is why it's so puzzling. They said this podcast is a great use of my time as I go about my working days and evenings. The thing I miss most about my college years has been the high quality lectures that I would attend, but now I can enjoy the same level of thought and discussion through this podcast. So, all right, well. Thanks for the review, Ewain. But if you're still out there, if you're still listening, this was about a year ago. Uh, somehow you gave the show one star out of five. So go back in there. Get back in Apple Podcasts and bump that score up. Bring it down the average here. All right. I'm Blair Hodges. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Maxwell Institute Podcast. And we'll talk to you next time.